you don't realize what a blessing it is to have her as a musician and tell you worship here and say, well, why is this such an exciting worship? Oh, the music's good. So. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. I'm counting my Sundays. This is 11, and I'm counting only three left, and I'm thinking, oh, what are you going to do after that, Gene? <laughs> so, anyway, I'm still glad to be here with you, and especially on um, this day, and uh, so many of you are here. That pleases me. I've already uh, changed my phone, so if you wish you had your phone so that when they call you, you don't have it ring in church, then there's your chance. So... I think that's all I need to say. Let's see if there's any announcements for the day. So, All right. Good morning, First Christian Church. Good morning. My fireworks show is over, so I am now able to join you back again on Sundays. It's been a very busy month for me. Uh, but let's look at our bulletin. Um, we can see that uh, um, as we uh, know, uh, Wednesday, of course, is Stitches of Love. Uh, there's still line dancing on Tuesdays. Um, and then Sunday schools every week at 9.30. We are going to try to speed it up today as today um, is uh, the funeral for the Oberlander family. And um, I normally don't find a good reason to go past the state border, but today would be a good reason. So uh, we have um, also coming up. I'm, I'm not done yet, but okay. I'll get to you. Monday at 4.30, yeah, it didn't say that. You're right. It was skipped. Uh, Monday at 4.30, the bells will practice ding a -lings back in the back. All right, very good. You like to say that, too. I hear you say that a lot. <laughs> it was so much fun uh, that they want to do a second, second annual um, bingo. Uh, that'll be Wednesday, July 20th. You don't want to miss that action. Uh, they will be doing dinner and desserts and begin around 5.30, uh, bingo to follow. Uh, they do ask, again, you bring a white elephant uh, gift for everyone attending. Uh, not for everyone. Bring one for yourself and uh, come out. One, come all, the more the merrier. I did miss that one, but we did plan on being there. We had a, um, a grandbaby issue come up that day, but we're going to be at the second second bingo. Um, so is there any additional announcements other than the ding -lings? Yes, sir. I want to say thank you to All right. Very good. Also want to say a special welcome and hello to everybody out there on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, if there's not any other announcements, uh, let's all pass God's love and pass the peace.
This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Good morning, everyone. Let's remain standing and sing together hymn number two, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, verses one, two, and four. God calls together a divine council. God holds a plumb line to measure our faithfulness. Lift up your prayers for God's mercy. Earnestly seek to know the ways of truth and salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask today that you come in and bless this sanctuary. Bless all those who are in it. As we receive your word today, watch over us as we take your message out into our community and out into the world. Father, we ask for healing in our nation. For Father, it seems as though every time we open a paper, turn on the TV, or get a reminder on our phones that there are more tragedies amongst this nation, mainly to our children. Surround our nation, be with us, and Father, we also ask a special blessing today as you watch over those heading south 
and to those who are in Dallas with the Oberlander family as they mourn their loss. Father, we ask this and many more things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I received a um, text from Paul um, Becky Kruger, and uh, they said, We're in Colorado. Please mention that Becky's longtime grade school friend, Robert Gregg, lost his battle with cancer. He is also a distant relative of Michael's, and so uh, that's information for us in terms of adding to our list of uh, concerns. Uh, he's, he's on the list under the cancer patients. Uh, and then a, 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 a concern that was raised this morning, uh, uh, some friends of the Cravens uh, uh, have a newborn. Uh, her name is River Banks. Uh, reminds me of the things that parents do to their children. So... Um, <laughs> His, uh, the, the father's name is Keith, but uh, the newborn has a liver trouble, and so we're asked to pray uh, for the r uh, newborn and, and those concerns. And then we've already mentioned about uh, Michael's father, the funeral, and we'll, we've already prayed for those. So join with me as we share a pastoral prayer. God of justice, your word is light and truth to us. Let us show our face as shining and help us, O oh God, uh, as you restore us, that as we walk in your way, uh, seeking justice, we find uh, that goodness coming into our life. You are our God of salvation, and you have sent your son to seek out and to save those who are lost. Hear our prayers, O oh God, on behalf of all of those who are lost in this day, and we're looking for ways to find your blessing in their life and your peace. We lift to you all of those that are listed in our bulletin, and we'll call them by name. Uh, we pray for cancer concerns for Paula and for Tom and Twana and in the death of Robert Gregg. We pray for Eddie, for Bill, for Ken, for Sharon and Lisa. We remember Tabitha and Becca and Kendall. We pray for Charles and Gay and Doug, and Cora, and Jack, and Fern, and for the Oberlander family. May your peace, O oh God, uh, pour out on us, and may we receive your strength and your courage as we live our life. Bring us your justice and peace, O oh God, Especially, uh, we pray for those in the midst of war. Help them, O oh God, to find peace, and we pray for your peace in these days. We thank you, O oh God, that you love us and that we are uh, in your blessings each day for peace and strength. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.
I borrowed a call to offering this day, and it says many of us uh, might someday have the opportunity to inherit or to offer an inheritance. I'm not here to suggest how you might use that inheritance or whom you might provide one, but instead I'm here to point out the question of a lawyer who asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response comes in a story which we know as the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus teaches us about life stewardship. The traveler responded with acts of love for a stranger, providing care for the victim. We too can do that. Let us receive our offering. When this life has overwhelmed me And I feel like giving up I will cling to all you promised It will always be enough When the world around me crumbles And it's hard to understand I will run to you, my shelter I am safe within your hands Oh, you are my
The grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks for the good and Jesus Christ. I and John, give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. Let the poor say, I am rich, to us of what the Lord has done for me. Give thanks. May these gifts, O God, bring light to those who walk in darkness. Bring hope to those who live in despair and justice to those who are oppressed. Grant to each of the givers a sense of participation in the most important opportunity of all time to share your love with the world. To this end, we dedicate these offerings and ourselves. Amen. All right. Just, just real quick before I get started, again, one more time, Crystal and Jan, that was absolutely beautiful. We're going to be reading from Luke 10, 25 through 37. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, you can, or you can follow along on the screen, or you can just listen. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life. He said to him, what is written in the law, what do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he set, saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds. Having poured oil and wine on them, he put them on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you have spent. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I picked as my sermon title today, The One Who Showed Mercy. And so I want to say a little bit about uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, and then I want to talk about mercy. So, uh, flashing through the Bible and beyond a lightning bolt known as prophetic ministry. What prophetic ministry does, according to the Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann, is to generate a consciousness and a perception of an alternative to the consciousness and perception of the dominant culture around us. Sounds like a good theological statement, um, and who knows what that is. Uh, it's one that I like to preach because I live in a culture uh, that has uh, that helps me be selfish and and self-centered and and uh, especially as I watch my television, there's always something that I need to buy, and they have commercials that let me know what that is. And so, you know, I'm just on the way all day long of the consciousness of the culture that I'm in. Uh, this is uh, no small order, though, to change that dominant culture. I, I suppose I think I've made uh, some difference in preaching for 54 years, uh, trying to make a difference in the dominant culture. Uh, we're over and against that culture of selfishness, preaching about God's justice in the world and making selfless kinds of acts on behalf of our uh, faith. Whatever the dominant culture happens to be, though, it's a particular uh, prophetic ministry that comes as we read the scriptures to try and overturn that apple cart and give us an alternative awareness of that, a different way to see the world. The biblical witness to God's of life when we faithfully accepted proves uh, not easy uh, to control that dominant culture. Jesus provides for us another instance of the prophetic ministry when he tells the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Today's gospel, we hear he presents this story in a response to a question put to him. The lawyer asks him the obligation to love his neighbor as himself if eternal life is to be his. But the lawyer then asks, who is my neighbor? And that's how the story comes into our awareness. Uh, Jesus speaking that word of who is our neighbor. Throughout the course of the Bible and beyond, God's people come to learn and they discover through experience that their God is the God of all nations and all people. 
We may think that God belongs to us. We may even think we're in control of what God does, but it's only an illusion that we uh, struggle with because we know better than that. We know that God is all-powerful. We may not be able, I'm not able to comprehend how big that is. On occasion, I uh, see um, mountains at a distance of 20 miles, thinking that my eyes can only see 20 miles, but when you see a mountain at 11,000 feet, and you know, it, it's just an inspiration uh, for that kind of thought, uh, we begin to see, oh yeah, God, God's big. God created that mountain. God is way bigger than that. I love it uh, the nights in, uh, when I go to camp. I almost always make it a point uh, to look up and, and because the Milky Way is always there in uh, June, uh, it's getting where the, the other light around has, has made it so I don't, that's, it, doesn't, it doesn't jump out of the sky and say, Gene, take a look at this. This is the Milky Way. Oh yeah, and that's just your galaxy that is being shown and there are multiple galaxies I'm told beyond the Milky Way how big is God uh, and so but God uh, pe people learn uh, to take the word neighbor as something different than uh, just the the uh, the people you may or may not know who live in the house next door to you uh, your neighbor can be someone on your block. The neighbor can be uh, someone in your neighborhood, uh, in your city, in your state. You can even talk about neighbors as being a part of the United States. I have neighbors in California. Uh, and I find even that I have neighbors in Ukraine, uh, people that I care about and worry that they're uh, under a siege that someone's going to come in and take their home and their property and annex that to a different nation. Uh, I care about my neighbors in that sense. Neighbors are not only those people that are near to you, but uh, you find them... Uh, everywhere if you just open our eyes and the, the whole business of prophetic ministry is to talk about that and help me understand that our neighbors include absolutely everyone all of those created in God's image it was tempting to just preach and tell the story of the Good Samaritan and I thought Gene, you've done that, and, and who doesn't know the story of the Good Samaritan? And I could emphasize that, but, but I found verses 36 and 37 that, that, that spoke to me in that passage. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And he said, the one who showed mercy... I'm aware that the sermon could end right there. And, and I told Sally I needed to shorten my sermon, but I don't think I want to quit yet. I want to talk about mercy. And so I read some uh, pieces that people have said about mercy. And so I want to change the speed of the sermon and move it from maybe a listening experience into a meditative experience. Let me give you, and I don't even know how many there are here, maybe 10 or 15 statements about mercy, and, and I'm letting them come to my ears and sink in a bit so that at the end of the sermon I'm going to say, can you go out and do this kind of mercy in your life, which I think is Jesus' message uh, for us out of the... So uh, what is mercy and why do we need it? 
Mercy fuels compassion. More theological statements that I need to listen to and let sink in. Providing promising glints of light in a darkened world. You have to then be able to say, what kind of darkness are you talking about, Gene? And then as soon as you've asked the question, you know that the world has darkness in it and that Jesus comes bringing light. It is kindness that forwards forgiveness. I had to read that several times because it didn't make sense. It is kindness that prepares us to give or receive forgiveness. I think two or three weeks ago, I preached about the importance of forgiveness. How do I get ready to be able to forgive somebody else? And it begins with kindness. When I've received kindness, then it forwards the possibility of me being forgiven and forgiving others and for finding empathy. That kindness builds an empathy in me. Mercy chooses not to be offended and compassionately sees a hurting heart behind hurtful words. Again, I have to slow down. Mercy chooses not to be offended and compassionately sees a hurting heart behind hurtful words. An opportunity for mercy. God's mercy is reflected in the cross of Christ. A direct reflection of his love for us. His love for us. Mercy is an extension of and expression of love. An act of kindness, compassion, or favor. Mercy is a characteristic of the one true and living God. Mercy is the characteristic of the one true and living God. So what does the Bible say about mercy? A kind of a different slant, still pieces of understanding of mercy. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Do you remember singing that hymn? Comes out of Lamentations chapter 3. The Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. A characteristic of mercy is that it never comes to an end. God's plan stems from his merciful love for his people, knowing there was nothing that we could do to earn our way into his presence. Reminds me of when I think I'll do something good, maybe, and I, people joke about it all the time, maybe that'll help me get into heaven. Well, it's good that you're doing something good, but I don't think it's a negotiation with God. Um, God already is merciful. God already wants you in heaven. If you can just have faith in God, you're on your way to heaven. It seems so easy until you think about that. He made a way through the crucifixion of Jesus, a defeating death, Jesus up, opened up access to God for us. I regularly use the word Jesus most often when talking about God. 
God may be so big, but Jesus uh, there, Jesus opened up access to God for us. Through prayer, God's word and the Holy Spirit living in us each day brings fresh new mercy, a fresh new opening to God's love coming into our life. Every morning, God is faithful, even though every day we fall short. There's a whole other sermon in that. Even though we fall short, God is faithful every day to us. Mercy is God's gift to the repentant heart. The following verses define this element of God's love. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. One of the Psalms says, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Ephesians, great book for personal growth. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Again, out of Titus, he saves us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. A part of the elements of our salvation is mercy. There's been other benefits of God's mercy. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Gets back to one of those, forgive because you can't be forgiven if you don't forgive. Here it is, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. God's merciful to us, and we then turn around to be merciful. The benefit of God's mercy include peace and love and joy. Part of the fruits of the Spirit, if you recognize Galatians 5. In Christ, mercy and truth come together. Mercy and truth. Sometime I ought to preach a sermon on truth. I'll work on that. Christ-centered people see a world through his perspective and his love f flows through their lives when we are merciful to other it brings their hearts and ours joy how do you get joy in your life try out being merciful when we submit to his merciful ways, we choose to acknowledge peace. Apart from Christ, this is impossible. Thankfully, his mercies are new every morning. Another quote from the Psalms. But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, good God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you. Mercy is the cornerstone characteristic of God. And the evidence of the repetition is clear. You find mercy in the King James Bible 262 times. In the English Standard Version, 157, 
makes me want to check out all of those versions and find out what else they defined mercy. The New American Standard, 99 times, 170 times in the Amplified Bible, 146 in the New English Translation. And then there's other times that mercy comes in when they talk about mercies, plural, and merciful. One of the words in the Bible is mercy. Are mercy and grace related? No question about that. Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Love is the common denominator between mercy and grace. Mercy is what gets us out of trouble, says Dr. Ray Pritchard. And um, having been in trouble, uh, mercy gets me out of trouble. I just wanted to give a personal recommendation. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mercy and grace and love and forgiveness are characteristics of the one true God, and we hear that. Whenever you possibly can do good to those who need it, do good. Society is entrenched with entitlement, and you've heard me preach against that. Uh, Mercy is that opposite of that. Our natural tendency is to act in sinful and selfish ways. It is only with a transformed heart that we can truly be merciful towards someone else. That whole mercy thing. Mercy releases human understanding in order to adapt and command to love the people he places in our life. Rick Warren writes a book, Seven Characteristics of Mercy. And one of those characteristics is learning to be an agent of mercy transforms our relationship. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Again, you get to receive mercy as you are able to give that. Partly you know about it and partly people understand that you deserve mercy. Mercy allows us to experience love and forgiveness and compassion and peace and joy. And so I'm coming to the point where I want to say what I have already told you I'm going to say. Uh, The first 15 daily devotionals, uh, we would be wholly lost if we weren't for the abundant mercy of our Heavenly Father. That's almost like a summary statement of what we've been speaking about in mercy. And so my message to you is God is merciful to us, so we are to have mercy on others. And that's where I finish my sermon on the sermon, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The one who had mercy, go and do likewise. I have an invitation to communion. It reminds us that at the table, we meet someone who cares about us. And we remember and put it together one more time. We remember Jesus, whose life, death, and resurrection, we find hope. We also find mercy in that place of this table. It is a feast for us, a celebration, a joy, a a banquet dinner as we come to this table. It relieves our pain and brings joy as we feel welcome. So bring your real self the one that needs mercy and forgiveness, and join us to find a welcome place and a balm for your soul. Let us prepare for communion. Let's remain seated 
and sing hymn number 265, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, verses 1, 2, and 4. Jesus, on the night when he was with his disciples before his crucifixion, was sharing the ritual of the Passover. And I'm sure that the disciples wondered what was going on when he changed the wording to include words about himself. This is my body, he said to them, which is broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and poured it out in two drinking bowls for each of the disciples. This is my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Receive forgiveness. Let us give thanks as we come to this table. Dear Heavenly Father, we have no words to express your greatness and awesomeness. You are much more than we can even imagine or try to express by mere words. But holy is your name, Lord. We do know that you are a God of love and that through you, from your sovereign, sovereign Lord, we can escape from death. The scriptures tell us that if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that by believing we may have life in his name. We take this bread today, Lord, in remembrance of Jesus, of his great sacrifice, and of the promise that it brings to us. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, and may we feel your Holy Spirit within us as we partake of these sacraments. We pray in Jesus' name. 
steadfast God, you are the rock of ages and the anchor of our being. Without you, we are nothing, but with you, we can be something. We drink this cup remembering Jesus and asking for a greater awareness of our presence as we come to the table of our Lord. Commit us, O oh God, to more worthy Christian love, sharing, and service in the opportunities that each day provides. Enable us each day to fulfill our mission for us in the world. Amen. Amen.
Would you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We've already heard of the blessings of mercy as we reflected on the story of the Good Samaritan. Each of us are invited to be one who loves unconditionally. As you go this day, may you find opportunities to be merciful and to share mercy with others. Let us sing our hymn of discipleship. Let's stand and sing together hymn 600, Yesu, Yesu, verses 1, 2, and 5. Master who acts as a slave to them. Yes, who, yes, who, fill us with your love, show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Neighbors are rich and poor, varied in color and race. Neighbors are near and far. with your love show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you kneel at the feet of our friends silently washing their feet this is the way we should live 